In the calorimetry experiment, we are using a calorimeter to measure the energy flow as heat from one, one substance to another. And a calorimeter is a container with insulating walls. What we use in the lab is two coffee cups stacked in one inside of the other. We have a little um, styrofoam top on that with a hole in it so that we can put a thermometer in it because we'll need to measure temperatures. And within the calorimeter, energy can transfer from one content or one place to another, but no, we assume no heat flows outside of it. So the calorimeter itself should not feel hot or cold from the outside. When energy is conserved, in this sense it is, within the calorimeter we can apply equation 1, which states that the energy transfer from a system to its surroundings is equal in magnitude but opposite in sign. So same quantity, but the minus sign just implies going from one to the other. If Q of the system comes out to be a negative number, heat energy has transferred from it. If it's a positive number, heat energy is transferred to it. Same deal with the Q of the surroundings. Okay, so we have a three-part experiment, parts A, B, and C. In part A, a hot metal is put into room temperature water, and we will measure initial temperatures and final temperatures. We will measure the mass of the metal, the mass of the water. We will know the heat capacity of the water. So basic, and we'll measure the final temperature. So we'll have lots of data that we need in order to find the heat capacity of the metal. And here's our experimental setup. Figure 1, experimental overview for part A. So we heat the metal. We will heat it in a beaker of hot water where the metal is contained within a test tube. We will heat it for about 10 minutes, and at that point, its initial temperature is 100 degrees Celsius. We will put water in the calorimeter, which again is a coffee cup, two stacked one inside of the other, the styrofoam style. We will put water in there. By the way, we've measured the mass of the metal. We will have measured the mass of the water. We will put a temperature sensor in there that's hooked up to the LabQuest. We will know the initial temperature of the water. We will have the temperature sensor sit in the water for 30 seconds to give us uh, uh, several temperature data that we will average to get the T sub I of water. The T sub I of metal, we assume then to be 100.0 degrees Celsius. After those 30 seconds, we put the metal in the water and we set the lab quest, quest so that for several minutes it's monitoring the temperature. And that will allow us to determine T final of the water metal mixture together. Now, going back up here, so our system is the metal, our surroundings is the water, so we have Q metal equals minus Q water, and Q of the metal is S of the metal, M of the metal, delta T of the metal equals minus S of the water, M of the water, delta T of the water. Of those quantities, we've measured M, M, delta T, M, well, we'll have T final and T initial of the metal, and we know S of the water, We'll have measured M of the water, and for delta T of the water, we will have T final, and we will have T initial of the water. So our only unknown is the S sub M of the metal, the heat capacity of the metal. It turns out that the molar mass is approximately 25 units or joules per mole degrees Celsius divided by the heat capacity in units of joules per gram degrees Celsius for a metal. Most metals follow this relationship shown in equation 4. So you will calculate a heat capacity for your metal and divide it into 25 and get an approximate molar mass. So that's part A. Part B has us mixing a solid into water, and as it, sublime, as it 
goes into solution as it dissolves, it either gives off heat or takes on heat energy. So here is our setup. We will have approximately five grams of solid, which we will have measured accurately. We will put new water into our calorimeter. We will measure the mass of that water. We will put the temperature probe in it, and we will wait 30 seconds. And from that, we will find T initial of the water. We will then add our solid to the water and we will let it run for several minutes and that will allow us to get T final of the dissolving. So our equations are that delta T of the reaction is Q of the reaction. Remember delta T and Q are of the system are interchangeable as long as the pressure is constant, which is the case when we have an open con container. Gases don't build up. And Q of the reaction is minus Q of the surroundings. And in this part B, the surroundings is referred to as solution. So once again, solution equals surroundings. So we're after Q of the reaction, which we're going to call delta H of the reaction. And delta H of the reaction is then minus Q of the solution, we are measuring information about the solution. Um, we're given in this write-up the heat capacity S of the solution, so we will have a number for that. We will have measured the mass of the water and the mass of the solute, so we add those together, we'll get the mass of the solution, and we will have measured Ti, and T final, so we will find delta T of the solution. So we'll be able to calculate delta H of the reaction. Part C has us adding an acid to a base. So our setup is shown in figure three. We will have a very accurately measured quantity of sodium hydroxide, and we will know its volume. We are given its density so we can find its mass. We will put the temperature probe in it, and we've turned on the lab quest, and we will measure that temperature for 30 seconds. We will then average those values to get Ti of sodium hydroxide. We will clean off the temperature probe, and we will put it in the HCl for 30 seconds. That will give us Ti of the HCl we will average Ti of sodium hydroxide and Ti of HCl. That will be our Ti. And then we will add the sodium hydroxide to the HCl. We will let it run for several minutes and that will allow us to determine T final. And we will have a setup number-wise very similar to what we have here in equation six and seven. Delta H of our uh, neutralization reaction is equal to Q of the neutralization, which is minus Q of the solution, which is, of course, minus Q of the surroundings. So delta H of, of this neutralization is equal to minus S of the solution. We're given the value in the write-up times the mass of the solution, well that's the, the mass of the sodium hydroxide plus the mass of the HCl, times delta T, which is T final minus T initial. So we will have all the quantities we need. Okay, so we're told how to prepare the lab quest and the experiment procedure. Be sure to read through that even though you're not actually doing the experiment, but you need to understand what we have will have done with it. So we get the data at part A, we take our data, we transfer it to a computer in Logger Pro, and we will then get a graph of temperature versus time that looks like this figure six. And the first 30 seconds, that was when we were measuring the temperature of the water. So we will average those first data to get the Ti of the water. And the little spike that we see when we've added the metal to our water is due to some of the metal 
hitting the probe, causing that spike. We ignore that spike. To get T final, what we're going to do is highlight the data from um, I can't really read the graph well enough. We're going to highlight the data after the spike up until about the end of it. We're going to do a linear fit of that so that we can extrapolate that linear fit back to when we first added the metal to get the highest temperature possible. Because although we assume our insulator to be a pretty good one, indeed the highest temperature is that when they first mix together. And so that will give us T final. For part B, depending on what salt we are working with, it will either be an exothermic dissolving process, which will cause the solution to get hotter. That would be represented in the graph on the left in figure 7, or it will be a salt that takes energy from the solution so it gets colder. That will be the graph in to the right in figure 7. So we will do the same kind of thing. We will average the first 30 seconds to get Ti. We will do that, that linear fit of the last part of the data, which is shown highlighted in the left graph, in the right graph. We will do the linear fit, which I'm seeing the linear fit on it. And then we will go to the point where we have first added the salt to the water and we think dissolving has occurred. And that should give us T final. And for part C, we will do a determination similar to what we're seeing in figure 7 and actually the data for the part C will, when we're graphing it, it will look a lot like figure 7, the data on the, the graph on the left side because when we add an acid to a base, that process is exothermic the solution will get warmer. So it will look something like figure 7, the, the graph on the left without that temperature spike. Okay, so you can ignore the pre-lab. Look it over if it interests you. And for the report, you're putting the experimental data, which when you watch the, the video, the experimental video, not the the actual experiment, the video of the actual experiment, you should be able to get all the information for the data that you need from it for parts A, B, and C. If you miss any, go back through the, the video so that you can catch it. So that's how you get the data for parts A, B, and C. And then for the results, you are using your data to calculate um, temperatures, masses, heat transferred, and finally for part A, the, the heat capacity of the metal, and then that approximate molar mass using equation 5, and by looking at the periodic table, just give it a guess as to what your metal is. For part B, from the data, you should be able to calculate all these mass quantities, and ultimately the temperature change, and the, the heat of the solution, therefore you change the sign of it to get the heat of the reaction. Now, you are asked to calculate the moles of the solid from the identity of the solid and converting from the grams of it to the moles of it, and you are then taking the delta H of the reaction and dividing by the moles to get the delta H in units of joules per mole. And then for part C, you're doing, um, you're getting the mass of the solution. Notice you're given the densities, you're given the, the heat of the solution. Also for part B, you're given the heat capacity of the solution, 4.002 joules per gram degree Celsius. For part C, 
the heat capacity of the solution is 4.087 joules per gram degrees Celsius, density 1.04 grams per ml. So you're not able to calculate from the total volume the mass of the solution. Um, you'll get the average initial temperature. That's the initial temperature of the sodium hydroxide plus the initial temperature of the HCl divided by 2. Um, from the T final, you're and subtraction, you're finding the temperature change, you're calculating the heat of the solution, and then you're changing the sign to get the heat of the reaction. Remember, that should be negative. Heat of the reaction should be negative. You're determining the moles of water formed by the reaction. So take the moles of HCl from the molar mass and the, I mean, from the molarity of it and the liters of it, and then we have a one-to-one -one ratio between HCl and water. That means that you have the moles of water. You're taking the heat of the reaction. You're dividing by the moles and converting to kilojoules so that you have the heat of the reaction per mole of water in units of kilojoules per mole. All right, and then you have a few questions. And that is then it. So when you are done and happy with your your um, report, scan it as a PDF file and submit it.